Welcome to the MBN Solutions Boston Data Podcast. My name is Robin Huggins. I'm Client Services Director for MBN Solutions, a UK-based data talent and people solutions business. We solve talent problems in the data space by collaborating with a community of practitioners, managers, leaders, academics, and enthusiasts. In each episode of our podcast, we take a deep dive into one of the topics currently challenging the data leaders within our community, with a special guest providing their input based on their background and experience in the data space. In this episode, our topic is brand and influence in the data sector. From personal through team and departmental to organisational, the importance of brand within the data sector has arguably never been more keenly felt than it is now. And with brand comes influence. Utilising brand to influence in areas like talent acquisition, self-promotion, side hustles and gigs, and general thought leadership and community activity is now a key component part of a data leader's toolset. Joining me today to discuss the topic in more detail is a data leader dedicated to helping the energy industry unlock value from data by delivering enterprise-scale data and analytics solutions and building high-performing teams from the ground up. With over 10 years of experience in data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, Dr. Adam Sroka, director at Hypercube Consulting, is a recognized expert and speaker in this field. Adam's mission is to bridge the gap between technology and business and to enable data-driven innovation and transformation across the energy sector industries. He's a LinkedIn top voice with over 50,000 followers and also shares his insight and best practices through his blog, podcast and tech community events where he showcases his approaches and systems for effective communication, engineering discipline and experimentation. Adam is passionate about helping organisations and data professionals maximise their potential and impact with data and AI. Welcome to the show, Adam Sroka. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Really excited to do this today. It's been a long time in the making actually. (laughs) It's probably the longest time in the making of all the shows. (laughs) Adam, thanks so much, mate. And, and I know from, from just the conversation we were having there, um, thanks very much for dedicating some of your very precious time to having a chat oh, with me dear. today, mate. And hopefully the coffee can keep you awake with the with the yeah. daughters. Yeah, no, too, right. The joys of uh, a young family, but it's been great fun. And yeah, no, I've been dead keen to do this for ages, so I'm glad we finally got around to it. Okay, I mean, yeah, me too, mate. So, Adam... Intro question. Here we go. Um, Thanks so much for agreeing to join me again. You and I have known each other for several years now, but for the benefit of the audience, can you tell us your story? Where do you come from? What's been your journey in data? Where are you now? Go. Yeah, yeah. So I, once upon a time, I was a physicist doing an industrial doctorate at Tallers in Glasgow. That's uh, the reason I moved up to Scotland and met all you wonderful people. I, yeah, I did computational laser modeling. um, And towards the end of that, I toyed about with some reinforcement learners and really just fell in love with that. This was 2014, 2015. So right at the peak of the hype cycle and everyone wanted to be a data scientist. And I thought, yeah, I could do this actually. I really enjoyed playing with the models and uh, went from there into my first data science role, worked for a retail data science startup in Glasgow um, that was really good fun, met some great people there and then hopped about a few places, worked in retail, worked in the insurance industry and I landed at the, probably like the career defining job for me was at Incremental where we, you and I met and I was um, a senior data scientist there, I was their first data scientist and I worked on some pretty big projects in the energy sector while I was there, had a really good time, eventually got made business unit director there. And that meant growing the data and AI team and doing a bit more. And that was a a very painful transition because I wasn't very good at it at first. And I I got better, I learned a lot and got a bit better as time went on. Um, But yeah, that transition from like individual contributor, being a techie, hands-on, like responsible for your own stuff to all the like emotional intelligence stuff and trying to lead and trying to run teams. And, and I think, cause I had such a painful transition to that. I became really obsessed with learning about it. And half the books on the shelf behind me now are about communication, like emotional intelligence, like trying to be a good leader. And, and that's, that's kind of where my writing is now, but yeah, that's where you and I met. And I, actually this is all about brand. And, and I talk about community brand events a fair bit these days. Um, but MBN, and you, you, Robin, were the first people to ever put me on a stage, actually, ever. 
to say, can we talk about, yeah. come up and talk about one of the projects and some of the stuff you're doing at Incremental. And it was in the Incremental office, I remember. Yep. In fact, yep. it's actually still on YouTube as well. Um, you can look it up. So I, Incremental was great. I was there for a while, um, eventually left to join. I really fell in love with the energy sector. So I left to join Origami Energy down in Cambridge. That was a really good, fun role, very different um, as the head of machine learning engineering. I wanted a slightly more hands-on techie role, so I got some of that there. Um, did that for a couple of years, and then I was one of these people that um, I think I'd have got to 68 and been like, right, next year I'm going to start my business. Uh, so the time was right. <laughs> yeah. Like I delivered what I wanted to deliver, and Origami was in a good place. So I left to start hypercube and here we are now uh, about 15 months in trying to build yeah data and ai consultancy that's really deeply verticalized focused on the energy sector trying to become domain experts and i've got loads of cheesy sound bites around like we're an energy company that does data and ai and not an not a data and ai company that does energy and all we that love yeah, good fun. Cheese, we love a cheesy sound bite sir get as many of them in as you possibly oh, can big fan of cheese over here um Okay, so you kind of mentioned the the brand and influence pieces come in there. So at what point in your career, roughly, did you start to realise, I mean, you've spoken there about, you know, the importance of those non-technical commercial skills around leadership. Mm -hmm. But at what mm -hmm. point did you think, wait a minute, there's something going on out there with regards to brand and influence and either I want to get better at that or I'm already good at it or when did it become something on your horizon that you started thinking about seriously? So there's a few prongs to that. Um, I think one of the reasons I progressed so quickly at Incremental was I, I've always been a reasonably good communicator. Like I, I've always been quite happy with public speaking. I'm, I talk a lot, right? So if you talk as much as I do, you get good at it eventually. Um but that comes from, and I never fail to mention that I once upon a time I was cool and I was a, I worked at a really trendy bar. Um, we won Best Bar in the UK in 2010. And that was a very high-end place. And actually, the team I was with were some of the most charismatic people I've ever met, could like command a room. And I learned a lot of like those skills there. And I think that's carried over into my career. And I found out very early that I was technical, like I'd done the doctorate and all that, but... I was unusual in that I, the communication piece came really naturally to me and being able to like work in at different levels and talk to different like mixed technical audiences. I've also played Dungeons and Dragons for the best part of 20 odd years. And again, I think like being able to role play and think yeah. about well, what would that person be feeling and things really helps with all, knit all that together. The brand piece though then came about because at Incremental I think they'd had a like a social media or a marketing guru in to do some advice and they were told to go and do some mixed media content do some video and then the marketing team went around the office and they went does anyone want to be on a video and everyone just said no and so and I was like I'll do it yeah whatever so they so they like put some effort in and took some videos of this early videos of me just chatting about stuff and what incremental was up to on linkedin and for a little while i i became like the linkedin face of incremental right. and so I, that grew my following to about three to five thousand people because i they were like every post from the company had, had like my name on it and it was quite fun and it was quite good and then uh when I left Incremental, I tried to do origami myself and I kind of didn't bother for a while and let it slip. Um, and then later towards my time at origami, I thought, well, actually, no, I'm going to give it a go. And I actually don't know why I started. I just kind of said to myself one day, I'm just going to post every day on LinkedIn. I'll just post something and just see what happens. I didn't really have a plan. I didn't really, it wasn't intentional to like grow anything from it. I just wanted to start writing, I guess. And uh, yeah, it just kind of spiraled from there, really. I'm, I'm just thinking about about timelines then, and, and and this is just me off the top of my head here, fella. But would perhaps the pandemic and lockdown have had anything to do with it? Was it was it being in the house, having more time to yourself? Would, was that anything to do with it? Um, I don't know. I because I started going at it seriously, probably 
2021. So we right, were well into just kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just had a kid. Um, <laughs> Why do you do like these things when you've child. just had kids? You should be. I don't know. Calm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, but. No, I don't know. It might have been. It, it could have been. I mean, well, actually, yeah, because I wasn't doing as much as my face-to-face gaming and stuff. I, I don't actually, again, I don't really know why I started doing it. I just did, I think. But maybe there's some good reasons that I'm unaware of. A perfect, a perfect guest. So why did you do that one, guest? I don't know. I just did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Amazing. Right. But you mentioned, so I, I can see it here, sir. It's you and I. We're setting up that room in Incremento. We've got the pizzas arriving. The people are starting to come in here. Um, you know, good times, mate, really good times. But I'm thinking mm-hmm. back to to the kind of compare and contrast because we've came on leaps and, blown, leaps and bounds. And if we talk about the data sector, and that's six years ago mm-hmm. now, and it's changed a lot in those six years. And what, what do you think, and, and just even one or two, any differences, any major differences in terms of the brand and influence piece in the last six years? What have you noticed? Yeah, and now it's hard because I only know what like I've known at each point because back then I wasn't really aware of brand and influence of being a thing. I know that like MBN did a lot, Data IQ existed, the Data yeah. IQ 100, I knew about that. I knew about like you did the, the some like data leaders dinners and events and things and that was good fun. I found the events really useful. Um, I, I used to like coming to the data science and tech meet up because you would come and meet people that were like doing something completely different to what you were doing, but they had all the same tools in their tool belt and all the same woes. And it was good fun to hear about interesting approaches to stuff. And it was a really good meetup that that one, because it was never very like veiled. You get some of them like a veiled sales pitch, right? And it's like, oh, here's a project and here's 25 minutes of a platform tour. Whereas I, I found that the MBM one was really like, Sort of down to earth and you were getting people like being quite vulnerable and exposed it was lovely um but i wasn't aware of like some of the as much of the brand stuff and i think the influencer thing in a b2b sense mm-hmm. has come on leaps and bounds in the last yeah. few years a lot of the people i talk to these days like talk about how linkedin is peaking like we are seeing linkedin be treated much the same way that Facebook was treated like 10 years ago. Like people are sharing more personal stuff and seeing it as yeah, it's acceptable. that kind of platform. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I found that I definitely, uh, and again, back to the pandemic, I think there was a, there was a watershed moment sort of mm-hmm. a year into the lockdown pandemic thing where it became acceptable. And, and, and I th- every now and again, I cringe every now and again, I see people taking it way too far. But I think it became acceptable to say, um, I may be Robin Huggins, I may be Director of Client Services at this well-known business, but I'm a human being with a family at home and I'm quite worried. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it became acceptable to say that, you know? And it's things like, like five years ago, I would never have even thought about putting a joke on LinkedIn, like ever. It was a very serious, like stuffy kind of shirt and tie platform. (laughs) And Nowadays, like half the stuff I write is nonsense. It's like memes and like really bad cringe dad jokes that I like. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on dad jokes. I've got three kids who uh, I think they're ready to disown me for the nonsense I talk. Start okay. a new dad joke podcast. Oh, mate, mate. Yes, yes. Let's and I've, I've, got a, I've got a great starter for you. A great starter for you. Anyway, back to the question, sir. Um I, I, and, and funnily enough, I'm going to choose a topic very close to my own heart here, which is talent attraction and acquisition. In what ways do you believe a strong brand for either a data team or an individual data leader enhances their ability to attract uh, and retain top talent? Yeah, I, genuinely, a first-hand experience of this, and I can just share some numbers, right? Yeah. I have put my... And like, it when... I've been very fortunate to go a reasonably sized audience, right? So all my numbers are now quite skewed, but the the advantages that that brings me and jobs that I attach myself to on, on a pro, like a platform like LinkedIn is just baffling, right? So for one of our customers, they were hiring for a role, um, for a graduate data role, and they had like a trickle, like uh, over a couple of months, I think they'd had like, 
tens of applicants and of a mixed caliber and i took the role on and i shared it as if i was hiring for them and they got 1300 applicants in wow. a week and muggins here had to go through all the cvs so that was great fun i kind of shot myself in the back there welcome but, uh, my world dudes yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you get very, very good at reading CVs quickly. Yeah. But so, uh, and that's for like a graduate role, right? But, uh, yeah. and you think, okay, yeah, well, is that relevant? And and by the way, this was an on-site role in Scotland. This wasn't a remote first thing. So this was people that were either in Scotland or willing to move to the Central Belt. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I have people that I look at and I like, Joe, you, know, you get that kind of imposter syndrome, like FOMO. You look at other professionals, you think that person's a wizard, like they're an absolute genius. I, I have had so many people of like, in my mind, that caliber, like well and truly like far more capable than I reach out to me because of my brand and my writing and basically say, can I be in the queue for when there's a space? Like when, if you ever need someone of my skill set, I would just like to work with you. And it's that for me, I would say that the way I write, uh, like because my newsletter is like long form content about the way I manage and lead and my, my LinkedIn is all about the communication, the kind of what I believe and my philosophy. And I get a kick in for that sometimes and the way I write and some of it's sensationalist, right? But it's all out there. And what I found was actually and the same is true for customer acquisition, but actually, like these people essentially have had like a nine month interview with me of what I'm like without me realizing it. Like they know there's no surprises if they come in and then I start harping on about engineering discipline because yep. like, it's half yep. the stuff I write yep. about. Yep. Yep. No, it's, absolutely. It, it's been the biggest, so so hard numbers from what we're doing at the moment, Hypercube, I put in, and now you have to promote jobs on LinkedIn or they cap them at 10 applicants, which is a shame. So minimum budgets are five or a day. And they they say that you can, the estimated, we put a data scientist role up recently, the estimated like by LinkedIn's platform, the automated number was like 16 applicants a month or something. So we promote it because they want you to spend 25 quid a day, which is ridiculous. So five pound a day was the budget set. And we got 180 applicants for that role. Again, on site in Glasgow, mm -hmm. 180 applicants in three days for that. And now you'll know better than I if those numbers are yeah. good or bad. Yeah. But for me, that was, we got some quality people off the back of that. And it's just because, our, yeah my luck surface is bigger, right? My surface area on the platform is that much larger. Uh, well, yes and no. My take on that one being, and, and back to the idea of numbers, it's it's not necessarily how many people respond in what period of time. It's the specificity and quality of the people who respond in that period of time. Mm -hmm. Because you could have, you could have 10,000 responses and 9,999 of them are garbage. But somebody's got to sit and go through all them to determine that they are garbage because you don't know. But if your uh, thought leadership and your writing style and that nine month period mm -hmm. have let people know exactly what you're looking for. And therefore, when they see the advert, they go, that's me. And if you get that hundred and whatever people and 90 percent of them are right, then, wow, that's the measurement yeah. that that we're really looking at. The other thing that, that I wanted to just explore as a supplementary on that, and we've spoken there about attraction, but but I'm thinking here about retention and I'm thinking here about one of the areas of concern that I've heard from a lot of, of, of let, let's just say practitioner level people, is that, that, you know, they're maybe working within teams, but what they're doing, it's a combination between impact and purpose. What they're doing is not, they're not being recognized for moving the needle in the way they're moving the needle or they're not being recognized that the purposefulness of the work that they're doing is perhaps not being recognized and when i talk to data leaders one of the things that i often emphasize is look find a way of highlighting this find a way of putting this work on a platform because it gives your current employees some way of of, of almost belonging to that team brand and it's so important what are your thoughts on that area just in terms of rather than just attracting the employee but retaining the employee yeah and so something that i wanted to do because again i'm trying to build a commercial business so i want to create I, I strongly believe in content and social media marketing because it's been successful for me i want to attract a certain type of person because it's not for everyone right but i want to attract people that 
and retain people that want to be very public facing because we're consultants, right? So we, we don't want to be shut in a cupboard. We want to be face to face. So one of the dreams that we had was almost like the the creator or the influencer factory. Like, can can I make a bit of a promise that if you put the work in whilst you're part of our business, I'll get you 20,000 followers on a platform. And, yeah, and yeah. actually, for some people, that's really attractive because I'm not like some marketing agency that's saying i can do this for you i've done it and i've done it for someone else yeah you you're you're the real deal you're you're coming at this from the perspective that they're coming at it from which is Mm -hmm. i am fundamentally a scientist but i really Mm -hmm. enjoy the communication and marketing and 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 and, and connection piece so if if you're coming from the same background as them and you can help them with that then you're legit you're the real deal and for the non and so one of the other benefits, again, when you get a big audience, and you get involved is we'll meander into this again in more detail, I think, but you you end up talking to the other people that are doing on this journey a lot as well. So anyone that's like got a significant following on LinkedIn, like in data, I, I probably chat to like once every few months and just like we will help try and help each other out. So we had someone join our business who was interested in this creator journey, but she was a bit unsure about like how to present herself and how to do it. And I said to her, look, like I can teach you everything like that I know. I can teach you all the stuff I've done, but I don't know what it's like to be a woman in the online space, right? So I can't help you with that. So I've just reached out to her favorite female creator in the data space who I happen to speak to quite a lot. And she now mentors her for me. So I was like, I can't help you with that, but I know someone that can, and here you are. And that's a service I'd happily extend to anyone that was in the inverse situation. And that to them was a really powerful experience, I think, because they were like, it shows that I can access people that that maybe they would love to speak to, but wouldn't know how to approach. And actually I've done that with techies as well. Like there's some really capable technical people, like, like industry leaders that, will answer the odd team's call to me just because I've got it. It's in my interest to help them out and their interest to help me out because I can help promote them, help them promote stuff or, or connect them with people. It's a really lovely benefit once you've got it. Okay. Um, so looking in the broader piece beyond, beyond talent, can you share an example of a situation where maybe a data team or a leader's influence has played a crucial role in shaping a strategic decision or an initiative within an organization? From a brand and perspective, I would say, again, for some of the really hard stuff, like really difficult to do things in our space, there's there's like a lot of people getting into or early career data. It's become really trendy. Loads of people want in and we've got that dearth of like folks with good generalist skills that are really capable, but for like niche experience or hard to do things, sometimes that can be quite hard to access. And to the point where actually like, you have to make the decision of do do we do this at all? Because we're going to have to grow our own skills and having that brand and being able to attract the people with those skills to you or reach out to them or connect with them can actually unlock other avenues for delivering things. And there's very few like technical challenges out there that I don't know someone that owns a consultancy that that solves. And a lot of it's because of my writing and we've met at events and things. The other thing is for some of our customers, and I don't want this to come across as I'm just bragging, right? But these are just some of the benefits. Like for some of our customers, I've pulled in people like that have literally written the textbook on what they're talking about. Like their challenge, there's a, an O'Reilly textbook and the, the person that wrote it has come on a call and spoke to the customer for me because yeah. I've shared some of their things or I've promoted their book or there's a, an open source package, right? We're delivering for a customer um, as part of a project. And I, I didn't have a clue that we were doing, we were using this package. I got the, the demo for it. And so I pinged the CEO who I've spoken to before of that open source company and he's going to come and do a workshop with the customer for free. And that's just like a win, win, win. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The customer feels special. My team are like, oh, wow, I get to meet the person that uses the package I like. I get to help someone and it makes me, us look well connected. So from a strategic point of view, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. But I think it gets yeah. you yeah. access to niche, rare, scarce skills that are hard to find otherwise. But I, the way that I think upon this and you're using that, that 
specific example of, of, of you as a, an owner of a consultancy business and your customers, but in many respects, almost every data leader has a customer of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that, um, and, mo and, and, and go back to the point that you made at the very beginning about um, you know the, the scientist, but with these these communication skills, and, and we've you know we've read about this for years, and you, you've lived this for you know a lifetime. The importance of having those technical skills, but allied with those commercial skills. And I hate the expression "soft skills" because I don't think there's anything soft about the ability to stakeholder manage and negotiate and communicate effectively. So I I see it as as, as technical and commercial skills. But I just think that for an awful lot of data leaders that I've had the conversation with their ability to influence their internal customer can often be wrapped around those communication skills, the, the branding piece, the, the ability to present themselves in such a way that's, back to your point earlier, about not just in the back cupboard, it's, it's front-facing, it's, yeah. it's on the front foot. Yeah, and I found that, for, for me, like, I quickly realised that no one else wants to do this in the tech space. No one wants to do the commercial bit. Like, a lot of us... I've been nerds growing up. We love maths and tech, and we just want to do hard sums all day, right? And that's fun for us. And to then say, actually, do you want to just be in Teams calls back to back all week? <laughs> like having arguments with people and asking for budgets, like, or having difficult conversations? No, no thanks. But the way we've structured work in our world is that actually that is a necessity in a lot of organizations. Being the only person in your company that's techie that wants to do it is actually a huge advantage. You just, you, you give up a lot. Like, yes, yeah, it's not fun most of the time. Yeah. But yeah. the fun bit for me is now that, like, you could put 10 of the best techies in the world in a room and they might not do any good work because they can't get on, they can't do well. And I can add that little bit of glue that can, help them be at their best and I can move obstacles out their way and I can communicate what they're doing or sometimes like so many times I've seen really capable people build brilliant solutions to entirely the wrong problem and not realize that they've not listened they've not heard quite the right stuff or asked the right questions so I always thought that I, all right I could become there's diminishing returns on like how good I get at code and there'll always be someone smarter and faster than me. But if I can convince that person yeah. that A, they want to work with me and B, they want to work with the rest of the team, then I'll be more productive just doing that. And I think, That's yeah, that... I justify it to myself anyway. No, but I think it, it, and there's a scary number and somebody quoted it on, uh, on another one of the shows and it was the old, um, is it a piece of Gartner research? It's like 90% of data projects fail. And there are reasons why they fail. And I think somewhere in the reasons why is maybe the ability to, you know, in simplistic terms, you're taking a brief from the client and then at some point you're saying to the client, well, hold on, well, really, you know? And that ability to engage and influence is going to have a determinant factor on shaping the brief to maybe something that could be successfully delivered. Because the last thing in the world from your perspective, from my perspective, or from anybody who's working in the sector's perspective, we don't want to be working in a sector where, Huge amount of investment, team gets built, couple of years down the line, it wasn't successful, they're all looking for a new gig again. That, that you know, that's mm -hmm. not the way. And if, and if influence and brand can have a part to play in that, then mm -hmm. to me it seems a no-brainer that it's something we should... And that's a really valid point, right? Because brand doesn't have to be public external, right? Yeah, like no, you get so similar. many organisations where, where like the average tenure is like 15 years and people are there forever... And in, in that, if you're at any organization for a long enough time, like you have an internal brand and you might not know what it is, right? So if, if you're not working on it actively and trying to make your internal brand something that's positive, that, that gets you listened to and gets you respect and gets you noticed for the good work that you do, then there's, you're kind of leaving it up to chance whether or not you're perceived as someone that people want to work with or that they don't want to work with. And that's going to cascade down into, do you get the good stuff to do or the bad stuff to do? Do you get the good team or the bad team? Or even more frightening, frighteningly, is that a cost centre I want to invest in or not? Mm -hmm. Because we're hearing a lot uh, of that at the moment. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Well, maybe you're like, you have an idea. Maybe you have an idea that is right and senior management deny the idea and they're right because 
actually neither of you have quite communicated the context or the understanding that that makes one of those things like the go no go decision turn the other way that just leads to it so much fr- like infinite frustration from the part of the techie because you know in your heart of hearts that this is the thing to do whereas they're doing that computer says no that's not part of the business strategy piece and that is just a communication problem and you need to either you don't understand the context of the business well enough to realize why you're incorrect or you can't communicate the benefits in the way that management and leadership can hear it and listen to it and that all comes down i think to like brand communication and your your sort of internal presence within an organization so it's not just a consulting thing and i do kind of before i shut up like i do believe that all data there are very few organizations in the world where like they are so mature on the analytics maturity scale that they have all these ingrained skills and things they do exist but there's not loads for the vast majority of companies i've seen you every data team is an internal consultancy like you end up being like a pocket of experts that help everyone out and show people how to do stuff a better way and empower them and and having a consultant mindset can be really helpful it's almost as if we know what we're doing here adam because the very next scripted question takes a little bit of a probe into some of that in a bit more detail how do you leverage and the, the two things here are how do you leverage data storytelling and visualization to enhance the influence of data-driven insights and make them more accessible to diverse audiences. Yeah, and I, so I would say, actually, I'm a very, very visual person. Like, I have to have a whiteboard with me at all times, and I love a post-it note, and I work very visually, and that's that's always been the way I've been. However, it's probably a huge weakness in that I don't produce a lot of especially in my writing, right? I actually almost exclusively do text right? because it's quicker and it's easier for me to write lots and communicate that way and verbally and textually. I I would love to do a lot more of that. In my consulting work, like I'm a big believer in things like Miro and yeah. really good visuals and and like I, I, I have like rules around being someone that is data centric, like I live in the world of data and numbers and graphs. I, I I have this like rule in our business that if I don't understand your chart within three seconds, it's a terrible chart because I'm coming from a place of, I live in the world of charts, right? So if you show me a chart that I don't get quickly, people that aren't yeah. as yeah. data literate or chart literate might, might just not get it. So really simplify so much of the visualization I see out in the wild, I think is is overly complex and it, or it's beautiful for beauty's sake, but it's not been designed. I actually love the um, the Financial Times style guide. It's such an amazing resource. You can just go and look at it. Someone's, you get it converted to like every visualization package you can see because it's so simple and it's just like small and crisp and it, it's communicate your one thing really, really well. Um, but I'd say it's probably a weakness of the way I do actually express myself publicly is I don't do enough visual stuff. Is that something that you've also noticed working within data teams? And I'm not talking specifically about your current organization. I'm talking about maybe in the past and your career that the crucially important way that ideas are presented to non-technical audiences mm-hmm. or the or, or the discussion around the idea, you know, here's what we think, he, well, no, here's, here's what the data suggests, here's what we think you should do with it. Do you think that's an area that maybe data leaders could work on from your own experience in terms of mm-hmm. their ability to influence the storytelling piece, the visualization piece? Is, is it good enough bearing in mind that the people on the other side of that chart are maybe not technical people? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is, is really hard because, you, again, think of the education, the pathway to a data role. It's like all STEM subjects, mostly um i know that's not always true but for a lot of us people that have lived in that lived in that world and then we go into tech roles we learn to code and we learn these packages and so on and so forth and then you you're interfacing with like someone with a master's in history and a law postgrad that is all a completely different suite of skills and way of learning and like essays and arguments and things like that And, and understanding Again, it's that role play piece, like role play, like where they're standing and what their perspective of the world is. Um, in, 
I think understanding like metrics and not just like being like oh, the KPIs are the KPIs. Like why are they the way they are? Why have they been defined as that? Understanding what drives the actual performance. Like what is this person's? I was thinking. Imagine everyone's on a bonus scheme you're speaking to, and then imagine even if they're not, and just imagine what is their bonus measured on? What number are they measured on? And once you can kind of conceptualize that or get them to kind of hint at it, you try to align your chat to that. And if in doubt, I always say like convert everything to pounds and seconds because it's the universal language everyone has. Like precision, recall, rock AUC, like all these lovely numbers, just pounds and seconds because immediately it's translatable and add your caveats and all that if it's really yeah. hard. But that's a good skill to have as well. Find, find the common vocabulary. I think, mm -hmm. but also from what you've said there, the common vocabulary could well be Dungeons and Dragons. If we can get more people yeah. playing D and D, mate, it's going to make the world a better place. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I think you could totally do like I think you could totally do like a a one day kind of workshop about like tabletop role play, a few sessions, and and as a skill building thing. It, it, but like. It, it's quite a big time sink. If you ever actually get into it, it takes ages. But anything that makes you like acting, like drama or yeah. even singing, things that make you express yourself like uh, Toastmasters, things like that, that are getting you to stand up comedy, like thinking about what you're saying and, and crafting like the way you process and communicate y your ideas. I think is a valuable passive, like it's a it's a great hobby to have because you're passively working on your work skills in something that hopefully is fun for you. That's the, that's a really really good point. And back to the the point that you raised earlier about that classic STEM subject pathway into, and I always found it quite. Um, I always felt there was something fundamentally missing here when we recognize and realize that the vast majority of people entering into the sector are coming from either comp sci or maths and science and their educational and probably pastimes and hobbies pathways probably pretty pretty predetermined and set but then we're asking them in industry to have this completely different thing this mm -hmm. thing around communication and influence and broad and it would be good. I, th I think that's something that if, I, you know, and I'm going to ask you a question about if you could jump back in time. I think if I could jump back in time, um, I think I'd be teaching postgraduate students, get yourself an expressive hobby as soon as you possibly can. You know, play a bit of D&D, &D, play a bit of guitar, do a bit of toast mastering, whatever you can do that's going to enhance and augment those commercial skills, the communication skills, your presence in the room, work mm -hmm. on it as much as you possibly can. Okay, so jumping back into, uh, I suppose here, the the way of, of, of showcasing, and I think uh, LinkedIn's an obvious answer here, but I am just want to probe around some other things. Well, what strategies and initiatives do you suggest would help showcase the success stories and the achievements of both a data team or a leader? How can these contribute to building influence? So it's a, it's a two-parter. What should people do to platform the work that they've been doing, and how can that help influence? Yeah, um... I think the biggest bang for buck internally and externally, um, but I've done this. I'll start with the internal use case because it's probably less heard of and more unusual. Just start an internal newsletter and send it to everyone in your company, right? Just at everyone, here's the weekly data team newsletter. Here's what we did. Here's a nice chart. Here's a topic. Here's a glossary of what it means, blah, blah, blah. Next week, we're going to be doing that and watch out, right? That if I've done that so many places I've worked now. It is absolute gold because you'll get like random people that you've never interfaced with email. You'd be like, oh, I always saw like data warehouse mentioned. I never knew that's what it's meant. Your glossary page is really useful, blah, blah, blah. Like you're front of mind and they know you're a person they can come to. And if they don't like it, they just block it, unsubscribe, whatever. It, honestly, the internal newsletter is absolute gold. It takes no time at all. There's a concept that called, oh, it's been years since I've read about it, but the 515s, and it's like every day or every week you write, you spend 15 minutes writing something like a log of what you did that day that takes five minutes to read and then you send that out or something there's a guy eugene yan who's an incredible like everything he writes is gold he's an amazon data scientist data machine learning guy but he um he wrote about it and it's a really nice idea just like 
it's almost like your work log, but just make it public and let people see it. That's the easiest way to start. Externally, you want to create a public brand. Again, newsletters are really easy. Get on Substack, just start promoting. Everyone else that's doing it will try and help you because it's actually a really collaborative, nice space. I found medium.com really good because yep. Yep. You, you can just get paid like straight away. Like you just, it's the quickest way to make money online, I think. Write a few articles, get them into something like Towards Data Science and you'll, just, you, you'll make actual cash money and it might pay for a round of drinks once a month or your coffees for the week. But like there's now, an, there's now a real thing that's come out of you working on those skills, I would say. That, that's probably for me how I would start. Okay. And then in terms of, of, of building that beyond, and I'm thinking here about things like, like and you mentioned at the very beginning there, um, Data IQ, other, you know, mm -hmm. awards mm -hmm. for recognition within organisations. Is, is there stuff out there that you're, that's on your radar that you're thinking, I could get the brand in there, I could get a bit of, you know, if, 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 if we were talking to a group of junior Adams, how would you be suggesting mm -hmm. they build their brand and build their influence with some of those external, what, what's good in your world? Yeah, I would say if you were trying to start and build a thing, I'd say pick a channel and just just focus on that and do it really, really well and make sure it's one you enjoy. I've For about two and a half years now, there's been a to-do for me that hurts my very soul to start a, a YouTube properly, and I just haven't done it. And I just want to get on YouTube and start waffling about this stuff and just because I know I'll enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, for goals and things like that, so a mentor of mine, used to talk about setting goals and he said you should always have like an impossible one a very hard one a hard one a medium one an easy one and a, a kind of always easy one always have those on the cards and uh, there was loads of reasons for that and we did this for my brand building and i had this was a few years back but i had a few of them like published posts in articles which i've achieved like um get on the stage of data fest that was one yep. i've done that twice now um so chuffed with that and the the impossible one was and this is so and there's no reason for this but it was just like set something really high was try and get on the bbc news talking about this stuff just because it like what would be an impossible really big goal and then it was just thoughtless so i've not done that one yet and if there's any bbc news producers out there that like my waffle but uh yes. I, I think just set really high goals and chip away at them and, and yeah. I, I, I've not actively worked on those things but they're in my sights and it can be an interesting way to progress maybe next year for the YouTube channel well this year for the YouTube channel for you it's the start know, of the year this could be the year dude this could be the year That's okay coming towards the end last couple of questions fella um, in your view what role does thought leadership play in establishing a data team's influence both internally and externally so how important is it? Um, it doesn't. I mean, it's quite rare, right? Actually, to be to to have like a lot of thought leadership isn't quite isn't that common. A lot of people just don't do it. They don't write. They don't share their thoughts. That's fine. Like, that's nothing wrong with that. That's the de facto way of being. You don't have to do all this extracurricular stuff. But when you do it, and if you've done it, like it can buy you a lot of trust. Yeah. And yeah. internal stakeholders would say to me, like, or they'd ask you things. And especially if you can go, actually, I wrote 3,000 words about that over three blog posts and they're here. So it's not like I've just adopted this stance to be difficult with you when you have a disagreement. Yeah. It's, no, I do believe this. And here's some more detail on why I, I've reasoned this out or like that that can build a lot of trust and credibility or, or like people can come to you and challenge these things and or agree with you so i think that's really important and then externally like if you're building a commercial organization like i know other consultancies that do this better than i do as a as a company but we have won most of our projects because of my online writing and things like that because i am very active and people Again, it's that luck surface, like the our surface area is that much bigger because we're out there doing it. So I think it can be, it can be very important, but it's not essential. Okay. Final thoughts, sir. Um, if you could jump in the way back machine and speak to yourself five or ten years ago, what advice on the subject of brand and influence, based on what you know now, would you give that younger Adam? 
Yeah, uh, take it less seriously and just get going. Just do it and just set yourself that lead metric, like just post every day. I wish I'd told myself that five, six years ago because I'd be so, I'd be further on in that journey and I'd develop the skills. And the, one of the big fear factors, I think, for every, a lot of people you hear, and it was certainly for me, was what if I write a blog post and no one reads it? Or what if it's bad or whatever? Well, then no one reads it. So what? It doesn't matter. Like, I would say 70% of my followers, probably more, come from less than 10% of my material. Because 99% of the stuff I write just gets missed, or 90% of the stuff I write just gets missed, no one cares. And then the odd thing will be massive, and it's the asymmetry of the response. And it's it's about, it's like saying to someone, right, we're gonna play baseball today. Um, I know you've never played before. Can you just go and knock out five home runs, please? Like, well, I don't even know. What end of the bat do I hold? I haven't got a clue. What are you on about? Where do I stand? Whereas, so that's when we're thinking, I need to bake a good bit of content from day one. That's essentially what you're saying to yourself. It's ridiculous, right? Whereas if you went, I just need to publish 30 pieces of content. Mm -hmm. like, okay, right, and just do that. And just accept they're dreadful. The first 100 will be terrible, right? That's fine, because you'll get a bit better with each one. And by the time you're at number 200, people will be like, oh, you're such a good writer. Oh, where did you learn all that? Oh, you're so talented. It's like, I'm not talented. I've just done the reps, right? Wow, man, thank you. Um, I'm going to, for the benefit of anybody out there who's not aware how to get a hold of you, fella, how would somebody connect with you? How would somebody get more of this sweet Adam Schrocker knowledge? <laughs> Yeah, I am most active on LinkedIn, um, linkedin.com slash in slash AE Strucker. Um, I'm AE Strucker on every social media, but otherwise in person or like come along to some of the Scottish events. I'm usually at like I'm, I, I like to be in the room and I think there's magic in the air where possible. Um, or reach out to some of the folk at Hypercube, a really talented bunch of super clever people and They'll be able to chin me when I'm overwhelmed in in like notifications and babies and business stuff. <laughs> and Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, Amazing. too busy with my wizard hat on. Amazing, dude. Adam, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks for sharing your passion, your knowledge, your expertise on the theme of brand and influence in the data sector. I hope you, dear listener, have enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. And if, and if you have, please take a moment to review the show on your podcast or video platform of choice, giving us five stars, obviously, and share this episode with anyone you feel would benefit from a view or listen. Thanks very much. Please do look out for the other episodes in this podcast series where I'm joined by other special guests discussing topics relevant to today's bosses and data. Visit www.mbnsolutions.com for resources like our UK data salary survey to watch recordings of our latest data meetup events or to download white papers, research and thought leadership. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter for the latest news, views, opinions and of course, hottest opportunities in the data space. Goodbye.